Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I hope you've had a good brown bag lunch. I hope you're enjoying your picnic on the bleachers at the moment, on the soft grass of Witte de Wit. Um, my function here is actually quite short, uh, is to thank Witte de Wit uh, for hosting uh, this part of uh, the afternoon, part of the day, and to introduce uh, one of the co-organizers of uh, the day, Jan van der Pavert, who will be introducing uh, the speakers. Um, so I'll introduce shortly for you uh, first Koen Brahms. When we uh, decided to uh, do something with these uh, documentaries of Chef, Corne uh, Chef Cornelis, we recognized uh, Koen Brahms uh, as someone who should uh, be talking about them, these uh, documentaries. Koen Brahms um, has been uh, editor-in-chief of uh, De Witte Raaf for about five years. Nine, nine, years. nine years, excuse me, and uh, director of the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht for 11 years. Okay, and uh, now you really work as a writer, full-time writer, and uh, he told me yesterday that he has done uh, several lectures on the work of uh, Jeff Cornelis, and each time on another part of uh, uh, his work, and, um, but not yet, he had not done it yet on these uh, documentaries, so um, now uh, you can witness uh, the last part, let's say, of, uh, of uh, his lectures on uh, Chef Cornelis, as if it were, and this will be a kind of cornerstone. When he finished, uh, we will have Adam Kleinman uh, as a respondent, and uh, Adam Kleinman is based in uh, New York. I have to watch this because... Um, Perhaps I, I will use wrong words. He was um, Lower Manhattan Culture Council, the head of, and um, he is a writer also. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But, um, but yeah, he also did lead... Um, I'm sorry. I, um, Lent Space, sorry, Lent Space, which was uh, a block in uh, Manhattan where he uh, organized a, a garden and where he um, invited artists. And um, as a writer, he contributed to um, several magazines and including um, um, Texte zur Kunst, for example, Agenda and others. And now he is uh, committed with the Documenta 13. And uh, I have to spot again this... Um, he is uh, agent for public programming. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I hear a lot of returns. I hope everybody understands well. If not, then just make a signal. Um, so in this lecture, I will uh, discuss two films which were produced by the Belgian television maker, Chef Cornelis. The first film is, is about uh, Documenta 4 and was made in 1968. And the second one is about Documenta 5 and was made in 1972. I will also show an excerpt from another film, which was made in 1966 and which had the Venice Biennial as its topic. Before introducing and discussing these films, uh, let me first introduce you to its maker. Who is Jeff Cornelis? Jeff Cornelis was born during the Second World War on June 10, 1941, to be exact. He studied at the Film Academy in Amsterdam, founded in 1958. And he arrived at the Film Academy at the start of the second year of its existence. By the way, one of his co-students was Paul Verhoeven. Paul Verhoeven. And uh, one of his teachers was Anton Kolaas, the father of Rem Kolaas, who also was a uh, student once at this academy. So from 1963 to 1998, Cornelis worked as a director and screenwriter for the VRT, the Flemish Public Broadcasting Company. In those 35 years, he built an impressive oeuvre, comprising more than 200 titles on highly diverse subjects. If we look at uh, Jeff Cornelis' filmography, it is not difficult to discern various groups of work. The most obvious are those about literature, architecture, and the visual arts. Within the very extensive cluster of films about the visual arts, 
A number of sub-collections can be distinguished. Cornelis has made long films about visual arts, but also short ones. The latter only for existing formats. Cornelis has made films about artists, but also about exhibitions, both solo and group exhibitions. He has also made documentaries about various arts scenes, for example those of Greece, and of various South American countries, such as Brazil, Argentina, Chile and Uruguay. The most important observation to be made about a group of films about the visual arts, however, relates to the noticeable break between a first series of films about artists and exhibitions and the second series about artists, exhibitions and art scenes. The first series begins around 1966 with a film about the 33rd Venice Biennial, of which you will see a short excerpt later on. This series ends in 1972, after Cornelis realized the film about Documenta 5. The second series begins around 1982 and extends to the end of Jeff Cornelis' career in 1998. We don't have to be too exact in giving the years, if only because Cornelis still made the occasional work about visual art. Without exaggerating the periodization or regarding it as absolute, we can nevertheless distinguish between the two sub-collections. What is, though, absolute is the fact that Chef Cornelis didn't make any film about a big art exhibition after finishing the film about Document of Five until April 1985, when he shot a film about the new Parisian Biennial. Between 1972 and 1985, Cornelis did visit big art exhibitions, he did continue to follow the newest developments of contemporary art, but he didn't make any film about a big art exhibition. So I think the following question is absolutely relevant. What happened in Kassel in 1972, which persuaded Cornelis to withdraw from the art scene as a documentary filmmaker? In this lecture, I will try to provide an answer to this question. By the way, an answer that I've made up myself and uh, is not in, it's not um, in dialogue with Jeff Cornelis, who would object to my explanation, for sure. So now we go to the second chapter, which is the, uh, the chapter about Documenta 4, 1968. In my attempt to give an answer to this intriguing question, I feel I have to imply Cornelis's earlier films about big art exhibitions. First of all, the film about Documenta 4, which he produced in 1968. Before having a look at this film, I think uh, I should introduce you to the Documenta, uh, for Documenta itself. In Documenta Documenta, the introductory notes of Arnold Bode, the founder of Documenta, the history of the exhibition is briefly sketched. In 1955, the first Documenta was mounted on the ruins of the Friedrichianum, Bode claims, without imagining that the second show would take place. The second Documenta was organized in 1959, four years after the first one, and Bode says, new friends came, the team grew, people spoke about Kassel. The third Documenta takes place in 1964, five and not four years after the second one, due to bu bureaucracy, Bode firmly states. And then the fourth Documenta. And Bode writes, and uh, I paraphrase, between the years without Documenta, there is only hope to have the next one. Everything starts all over again, like in 1955, 1959, and 1964. 1968 was, though, another year than 55, 59, and 64. In the second edition of the catalogue, of which I only have a copy, it's not of the first edition, this becomes clear as well. In small letters under Bode's text, the following remarks are made, and I quote, this text was written in the last weeks of May 68. From June 1 until June 9, the following events took place. Andy Warhol was shot in New York. The triennial in Milan was occupied by students. Robert Kennedy was murdered in Los Angeles. Should the Biennial of Venice be occupied? People write that red, red flags might be hung at the facades of the buildings of Documenta 4. End of quote. Though Documenta 4 was still being supervised by Arnold Bode, the founder of the format, a lot of changes had taken place. For the first time, the exhibition's organization 
was entrusted to a so-called Documenta Raad, a Documenta Council, who had 24 members. These members were subdivided into various working committees for painting, chaired by Jean Lerio, for sculpture, chaired by Edward Trier, for prints and multiples, chaired by Wilder Gekken, and for so-called ambient or environments, chaired by Herbert Freyer von Wittler. Arnold Bode was part of all the working committees and signed as the overall leader, but it was clear that things had changed. The first words of Bode's introduction couldn't be clearer. He writes, this documenta doesn't belong to the establishment. The true meaning of the documenta is that the documenta does not exist as an established institution. It sounds as if Bode had understood the upheavals in a number of European cities, in among others, Brussels, Milan, Prague, and of course, Paris. Documenta 4 presented itself as the youngest documenta there ever was. All forms of retrospective were eschewed, and the exhibition concentrated completely on works of art which were conceived of after Documenta 3 of 1964. A last detail before looking at Cornelius's Documenta 4 um, concerns the following. After the natural death of two council members, Jean Lering, the young director of the Stele Museum Van Abbe uh, of Eindhoven, was appointed head of the painting committee, the most important committee of the exhibition. Lering emerged alongside Bode as the decisive figure heading the exhibition. And I propose we now have a look at the first 12 minutes of the film about Documenta 4. Il est très important, je crois qu'il est primordial que l'artiste prenne conscience qu'il doit être un individu comme les autres s'il veut faire de l'art, que cet art ne soit ni agressif, ni transformé. C'est une illusion. Non, ce n'est pas possible. C'est une illusion. Ah, non, je ne pense si pas, si pas, si pas du tout d'une si illusion. Vous je vous connais, artiste, euh, si vous êtes un artiste, si vous prenez un crayon, je vous, prendrez artiste, ce, artiste, vous, artiste, vous prendrez ce crayon autrement que moi. Bon, mais je suis un artiste et je me refuse à prendre le crayon parce que je pense que si le crayon tombe dans ma main, j'en ferai un truc qui Si vous prenez un collage, c'est la même chose. Ja, de vierde documenta, die uh, uh, verschilt dus van de vorige. En dat was ook direct dus de opzet dat die zal verschillen van de vorige. Uh, namelijk in dit opzicht dat men een tentoonstelling wilde maken, niet meer met een overzicht van 20 eeuwse kunst of van oude kunst, zoals alle drie voorgaande uh, te zien gaven. Maar dat men daarom nu de vierde dus verschillend te maken. Uh, een thema zou kiezen, als thema zou nemen, de kunst van de 60 jaren, 
Uh, dat werd aanvankelijk zelfs zo geformuleerd. Uh, datgene wat na de laatste documenten actu actueel is. Deze document dat zeigen wil, wat in de laatste vier jaren aan entscheidendem uh, geleistet worden is innerhalb der modernen Kunst. En daar bekomt man den indruk dat etwa 80% der ausgestellten Werke schon vor vier jaren actueel waren en niet erst jetzt. Maar ik moet zeggen, het is actueel, maar ik trouw het heel bien fait. Pour, pour l'état actuel, moi, je ressens euh, un certain malaise parce que l'information me laisse beaucoup plus rêveur que l'exposition. Non, actualité. Euh, Naturellement, euh, je kunt onmogelijk kun je een, euh, euh, zeggen van nou alles wat nieuw is, dat gaan we opnemen. Want euh, de kwalificatie nieuw is een euh, uitermate bedenkelijke en euh, betrekkelijke kwalificatie en geen reden om daarom een zaakje dus op te hangen in een selectieve tentoonstelling. Dus op welke gronden zou je kunnen zeggen wordt het selectief gemaakt? Het oude antwoord is dus altijd euh, op kwaliteit. En natuurlijk die kwaliteit die is altijd euh, ook euh, heeft een zeer grote rol ook hierbij gespeeld. Maar vooral in het gebied van de actuele kunst moet je vaak zeggen van ja over kwaliteit nee, dat zal ik wel zien. Uh, dat zal ik wel zien in zoverre, want ik heb nog niet de, de intellectuele uh, of uh, uh, de gevoelsmatige uh, handvaten om uh, een scherp en een wat meer langdurig oordeel te maken over van dat is goed en dat is niet goed. Uh, ik heb zelf dus uh, van het begin af aan gezegd, heb ik een voorbeeld genomen, ik had juist... De, voordat ik de, de eerste keer naar deze vergadering toe ging, heb ik de Christo tentoonstelling gemaakt. En er was de, dus nogal van verschillende kanten nogal kritiek opgekomen. Zowel zeer goede, maar ook zeer afwijzende. Aan uh, wat ik dus, uh, wat ik mij tijdens die tentoonstelling bewust geworden ben, dat is uh, het volgende. Ik wist namelijk voor de tentoonstelling, zou ik heel moeilijk een kwalitatief oordeel hebben kunnen uitspreken over de zaken van Christo. Maar. Ik vond dus in dat werk dus een intensiteit van blik ja, en een intensiteit van, laten we zeggen, een relatie te kunnen opbouwen met de realiteit zo sterk aanwezig. Ik zei, deze intensiteit is het waard om gebracht te worden. Quand un visiteur entre un document, s'il est objectif, il en retire immédiatement une impression de malaise. Cette impression de malaise, c'est que une partie de l'exposition, c'est en partie Lié consacré aux, aux Américains est une exposition jeune, forte, puissance qui réclame un certain espace et qui donc donne un certain effet. Et on s'aperçoit peu à peu que les parties réservées à l'Europe sont généralement plus petites de taille. Cela est dû aussi à l'exiguïté des dimensions des œuvres présentées, mais l'ensemble crée une sorte d'exposition déséquilibrée dans sa structure organique. Euh, tout se passe comme si on voulait donner l'impression que, d'une part, il y a une Amérique jeune, puissance, puissante et efficiente, et que, d'autre part, il y a une Europe qui est en train de mourir lentement sur des chaînes culturelles et visionnaires passées. La chaotique. Um, the, uh, the, the work is good, but it's not enough room for it. They are ordered, over-ordered. There are too many pictures. Je pense que l'exposition comme Documenta, qui avant tout a pour but officiel d'être un panorama objectif de l'art contemporain, une exposition comme Documenta doit obéir à des règles de muséographie précises. Et elle ne peut pas se permettre, même si dans le cours de la sélection, l'apport américain a été plus important que prévu, une exposition comme Documenta ne peut pas se permettre de créer ce déséquilibre visuel entre, disons, deux esprits, deux visions du monde et deux cultures. Euh, il y a deux poids et deux mesures. Certains artistes ont reçu la possibilité de s'exprimer avec plénitude, plénitude et d'autres artistes invités n'ont même, même pas vu leurs œuvres acheminées comme c'est moi. C'est-à-dire la moitié de mes œuvres sont arrivées. Après, on m'a dit qu'il n'y a plus d'argent pour envoyer les autres. Non, je n'ai pas pris mes photos parce que je ne suis I'm not interested in making a political gesture, and uh, I thought that it would be seen that way. Um, I'm very disappointed with the hanging of the pictures, and I have asked several times that they could be moved to a different spot. But um, each time, inevitably, the director has his own problems because everybody wishes to be moved to a different spot. 
but in fact the only people moved are the people who wield some power. Il y a une chose aussi que je trouve un peu curieuse. Moi, je ne suis pas venu avant par discrétion, mais je me suis aperçu que les gens qui viennent 15 jours avant, eh bien, ils placent leur boulot, et les gens qui viennent en, en général, ce sont surtout les marchands. Alors, on arrive dans une manifestation, on voit les marchands ranger les boulots. Vous trouvez ça normal qu'un marchand range les boulots dans sa galerie Ça va, c'est tout à fait normal, mais que les marchands arrangent les boulots. Alors, si moi, je n'ai pas de marchand, je ne suis pas arrangé. Eh bien, euh, je me retire de la documenta. Et moi-même et, et de très nombreux camarades artistes, pour une raison très simple, c'est que la manière dont sont envisagés à l'heure actuelle dans la plupart des compétitions internationales et des expositions internationales, dont particulièrement la documentale, dont la manière dont est envisagé l'art, transforme l'œuvre artistique en un produit de consommation. Et c'est très caractéristique aujourd'hui avec la documenta où l'œuvre d'art est présentée comme dans un système qui ressemble un peu à la World's Fair. Pourquoi est-ce qu'on participe à l'exposition On se retirer par après. Mais je pense que ça peut, ça peut prendre le caractère d'un acte symbolique, le temps, n'est-ce pas Et c'est une façon d'attirer de, de l'attention sur des problèmes et très, très graves qui, qui a la situation actuelle de l'art, qui personne, on dirait, peut le reconnaître. Je rencontre beaucoup d'artistes qui sont très sympathisant pour les mouvements de gauche, très sympathisant pour les étudiants, très sympathisant pour les choses. Mais du moment où on touche à sa propre euh, euh, activité, n'est-ce pas, ils sont plus déjà d'accord. Le protest de France, contre andere César, Reis, de Marco Le Parc, qui de zich in hun manifest dat vandaag dan uit moet komen, dat de geest niet in overeenstemming is met de criteria van de vrije en objectieve informatie. Dat is dat dus en dat ze zich daarom terugtrekken. Um, Hoe sta je daar dan tegenover? Nou, uh, ik vind dat een statement. Uh, ik heb meer gehoord deze morgen, dus over uh, de bezwaren die ze hebben. Die bezwaren die ze hebben, zijn vaak van technische aard. Aan uh, het feit, dus bijvoorbeeld, dat ze vinden dat, we, dat ze geen goede ruimtes gekregen hebben. De, Het is natuurlijk als je dat gebouw bekijkt zoals het dus gemaakt is op het ogenblik door de man die daarvoor verantwoordelijk is, dat is Bode, dan kun je daarin onderkennen. Dus een aantal, eigenlijk twee ruimtes die een geweldige uh, indruk maken door een grote 50 meter lang, uh, 11 meter breed, uh, 9 meter hoog en de tweede ruimte die is dan wat korter en wat smaller maar even hoog. Uh, en daarnaast zijn ruimtes waar, laten we zeggen, iedere kunstenaar in 1964 nog gelukkig mee was. Maar die deur, namelijk het feit dat ook die grote ruimtes, dus door dergelijke grote stukken, dus ingenomen worden, nu plotseling een tegenstelling oproepen, wat een indruk maakt alsof ze inderdaad, laten we zeggen, dus... Uh, Je gelooft dus dat het onvoldoende behandeld zijn. Niet zozeer een, een theoretisch protest is, maar dat het meer een protest is tegen de ruimte die ze zelf innemen. Ja, dat is een van de belangrijkste uh, gevoelens die erachter zit. Donc il n'y a pas de doute, au fur et à mesure du travail d'élaboration de documenta, l'exposition a changé de sens. D'information objective, il est devenu de plus en plus attiré vers un certain pôle de l'information. Et c'est ça, finalement, je pense, que l'on peut reprocher à, à documenta. Étant bien entendu, euh, Karl, que cette contestation est d'ordre technique. Si elle doit devenir politique, je serai le premier moi-même à le refuser, parce que je pense que documenta est comme formule, de manifestations euh, et de confrontations internationales, l'une des plus valables. Parce que il n'y a pas de prix à Documenta et l'organisation est entre les mains d'un certain nombre de spécialistes reconnus par tous. Donc, il est important, il est primordial que la piste prenne conscience. It is, impor it is important, it is primordial that the artist becomes conscious. This is the very first sentence of the film, pronounced by an angry young French artist. This sentence is followed by another sentence, which is a true blow. C'est une illusion. It is an illusion. This sentence is voiced by a person who is not before the camera, probably behind it. It is clearly the voice of an older person, 
probably of Carol Gerland, acting as reporter in this film of Jeff Cornelius. By the way, is, this is not a guy who was posing the last questions to John Leary, because that's a Dutch um, art critic. Um, Carol Gerland was the guy who was sitting next to the sound technician. And this becomes important later in the talk. So after this tough discussion, the film starts. The camera slides over a painting. First we see the word television, followed by the words clothes, bed, telephone and shadow. The camera then steps back and we see the whole painting by Fugaku Arakawa. Images of the words in the Arakawa painting are followed by the cardinal numbers of Robert Indiana. One, two, three, four. So we have had words as television and then we have the figures. The series of figures ends with zero, so it is a countdown. The program can start. In the meantime, the soundtrack is meaningful as well. We have heard the sound of a machine, which at some points alludes to a cash register. Everything I have pointed to so far might be called classical rhetorical devices in the work of Jeff Cornelis at the end of the 60s. The controversy outside, on the pasture, right before the Friedrichianum as a false start of the film, the playful use of words, figures and sounds to count down to the real start of the film, and then the appeal by the work Inter Relazione Speculare of the Italian artist Getulio Alviani. While the plastic foil is being touched, the viewer can discern the cameraman who is shooting the picture we are seeing, another trope in the work of Chef Cornelis at the end of the 60s. Later on we will see the sound engineer sitting next to Karl Gerland, who interviews Jean Lery, the director of the Van Allen Museum in Antwerpen, and the chairman of the Working Committee for Painting. Cornelis wants the viewer to be aware about the tools he's using to make the film. When you witness Saul Hewitt brutally unpacking his 47 variations on three different types of cubes, we become aware that we are privileged to see something that we would never be able to see without Cornelius's camera. We also get an important indication about the moment this was filmed, namely short before the opening of the exhibition. This is an important factor and I will return to this later. After Jean Lering has described the ambitions of the exhibition, Harald Zeman criticizes Documenta. I feel a certain dejection, he says, because the information made me dream more than the exhibition. Slowly we move to the heart of the matter. Jean Lering is defending the exhibition, which is under attack by art critic Pierre Estany, who again talks about a malaise, a dejection. The dejection has not so much to do with the over-representation of American art, Documenta 4 included 57 American artists, while in total 151 artists were invited and has since been known as Documenta Americana. The overrepresentation of the American artists was not at stake. What was causing a controversy was a simple fact that these American artists who produced the biggest works had been allocated the biggest spaces in the Friedrichiano, the main exhibition venue of Documenta 4. While Restani is complaining, the camera travels in these large spaces. Restani states, on the one hand we see the United States as a powerful nation, while on the other hand Europe is slowly dying. The British artist Ellen Jones confirms what Restani said. He states, and you will remember, I have asked several times that they, his artworks, could be moved to a different spot, but each time inevitably the director has his own problems because everybody wishes to be moved to a different spot. But in fact, the only people moved are the people who wield some power. But Jones has not come to the conclusion to withdraw his work because, he says, he is not interested in making a political gesture. Some other artists did come to the conclusion that it would be better to pull back their works. Their names, uh, Julio Leparque, Marcial Reis, Enzo Mari, Takis and César Pavicini. Reis claims that uh, not all of his works were transported to Kassel due to insufficient budget, and he adds that artworks clearly have been transformed in commodities. César shouts that galleries have been, or dealers have been dealing with the installing of the artworks and that this is improper. And Julio Leparque calls it a symbolic action and says that it is remarkable that many of the artists sympathize with the left but don't draw the proper consequences, especially when their artworks are at stake. 
Le Paris Christ, Takis, and the others also publish a manifest in which they state that the spirit doesn't match the criteria of free and objective information, and they further claim, at Documenta we note once more that the main function of cultural institutions resides in the process that renders art sacred, and consequentially in its mystification and its purpose, the marketing of cultural product. The artists withdraw their works on June 25, the day before the opening of Documenta 4. It comes not really as a surprise that Jeff Cornelis has inserted the statements of Le Parc, Thais, Takis and the others in his film. What is though surprising is the fact that he has included the protest of the French or France-based artists, but not the remarkable events which took place one day later. On the day of the opening there was protest as well. A loose group of members and supporters of the German magazine Interfunktionen staged a protest action at the press conference. Jörg Immendorf smeared honey over the microphones, while his wife, Chris Reinecke, hugged and kissed everyone, including uh, the alarm curator Arnold Bode. Vostel poured a bag of change in front of the curators as a symbolic donation, and Fritz Heubach, the editor-in-chief of Interfunktionen, raised a banner reading Professor Bode, we, the blind, thank you for this pretty show. So none of this is in the film of Jeff Cornelis. No footage at all, and nobody even refers to it. The Interfunktionen protest was largely about the absence of certain art practices in Documenta 4. Immendorf, Reinecke, Vostel and Heubach claimed that Documenta should have offered a forum for fluxus and happening. In a way, you can state that these artists wanted to be in the documenta, while the French artists, like César, Le Parc and Takis, thought it made more sense to get out of the documenta in order to make, and I quote, a symbolic contribution to the collective awareness about the cultural revolution. It's clear which position is favored by Jeff Cornelis. Though it is very interesting to conclude that Cornelis has made a clear distinction between the French and the German protest action, devoting a lot of television time to the French contestation, because they, it's a recurring discussion in the film, and ignoring completely the German performance action, it is also fair to state that Cornelis adopted a straightly critical stance towards the art field in general. This was the case since the very first film he made about a big art exhibition, the Venice Biennial of 1966. So in 1966, two years before he made the film about Documenta 4, Cornelius was asked to cover the 33rd Venice Biennial, and this was his answer. Scusi, chi va mo chi è Molaglione? È siciliano, mettete lo diavolo. Sì. A destra il presidente della Biennale. Sì. Dopo il presidente della Biennale, il sindaco. Sì. Dopo il sindaco, il presidente della provincia. Sì. 33 de internationale kunstbiennale van Venezia werd op 18 juni geopend. Het was weer best dit jaar. Good morning. This is David. Op 17 juni wist iedereen de uitslag al en konden de kranten rustig het palmarès drukken. Normaal voor Venetië. Speciale 
Zit u namelijk zo. Vier dagen voor de officiële opening van de Biennale kun je, als je van de pers bent of een flinke som neerlegt, de nationale paviljoenen bezichtigen. Boze tongen beweren dat op dat ogenblik alles beslist wordt, van die prijzen en zo. Maar ja, boze tongen. Maar het circus duurt voort. Show must go on. Sì, ma se lei ha parlato con Gian Ferrari ha sbagliato perché doveva parlare col capo dell'ufficio stampa. No, mi hanno detto che qui era. Wir haben schon schon ein andere gemacht und das ist noch immer beim Büro oder wenn man muss ein ein andere machen. Warum? Für die Frau. Aha, ja. Moi, je pense que Fontana mériterait le prix, sans aucun doute. Mais je pense que, exactement pour cette raison, parce qu'il le mérite, qu'il ne l'aura pas. À la Biennale, vous savez très bien comme moi que, malheureusement, c'est le fruit de compromis de caractère politique et autres qui détermine l'adjudication d'un prix. La Biennale, je regrette de le dire, euh, ne peut pas, dans, les, dans sa structure actuelle, euh, avoir un rôle qui soit vraiment efficace. Et je vous dirai tout de suite pourquoi. La Biennale arrive toujours en retard. Elle ne présente jamais les œuvres qui sont véritablement à l'avant-garde au moment où elles le sont. Tous les organismes qui sont à la tête de la Biennale sont des organismes bureaucratiques. Mais moi, je pense que la Biennale est en fait trop agréable sur le plan, comme je vous le disais auparavant, de rencontres mondaines, etc., pour que ça puisse, puisse, que ça puisse mourir. Donc, tout le monde connaît la situation, mais tout le monde joue le jeu. The film about the 33rd Venice Biennial starts with a poster of the art manifestation showing an elegant B of Biennial and an S gorgeous V of Venetia. Even before we see the first moving images we hear noise for which the voice of a woman slowly emancipates herself. Very soon we are able to identify the source of the voice, a woman is allocating the places of the dignitaries who will be witnessing the opening of the Biennial. We see a police agent who is fooling around, men who make photographs, a woman who is involved in small talk. We even see a cardinal who greets. So when the off-screen speaker in has told us that the names of the winners of the prizes had been known long way before the official ceremony, we witness the official presentation of the, Vene of the Venetian Golden Lions. Four of the laureates show up, the French artist Etienne Martin, the Danish Jacobson, the Italian Viani, and one artist who we know already, the Argentinian, Paris-based artist, Julio Leparc. The fifth prize winner of the Italian, Lucio Fontana, is not present. It should be clear, the film about the Venice Biennial starts at the most remote edges of the art manifestation, with shots of a master of ceremonies, a, a dressed-up policeman, paparazzi, a society figure, and a cardinal. First we see these characters, and then we come close to the false essence of the event, the distribution of the Golden Lions. We have arrived in the place for spectacles and shows, for exuberant wear glasses and empty pots, for cameras and canned applause. Short, we have arrived in the place of Federico Fellini. By the way, we encounter a few figures who might have appeared in one of his movies. After the Golden Lions have been distributed, we see images of a German visitor who wants to get into the Giardini, and who faces the Italian bureaucracy. We still literally find ourselves at the far end of the exhibition. And when the camera finally gets access to the exhibition venue, pictures of the Russian pavilion are shot. The camera is very interested in the cleaning of the pavilion and follows slavishly the vacuum cleaners. There is art in this pavilion, but the camera doesn't pay attention to it. After this scene, Art critic Arturo Schwartz is offered time and space to give his comments on the biennial. Harshly, he criticizes the Venice biennial. And I quote, I regret to say that the biennial with its current structure cannot play a very effective role. 
And I tell you why, the biennial is always late. It never shows works that are really avant-garde when they actually are. All the bodies in charge of the biennial are bureaucratic bodies. The statements of Arturo Schwartz have been edited by Jeff Cornelis. It is not one stream of statements, one after the other, but a compilation of pieces of a much longer interview. The questions of the interviewer have been deleted in order to allow the statements to have a maximum impact. The interviewer, though, has the last words. It's a killing statement. Everyone is aware of the situation that plays along. I've only shown the start of the film at four minutes. The other 26 minutes, though, don't differ so much from the first four. Time and again, the biennial is portrayed as a party floor for the rich and famous, and constantly extremely critical statements are being formulated one after the other. If we try to find common ground between the excerpt of the film about Documenta 4 and the excerpt of the film about the 33rd Venice Biennial, which was produced two years earlier, and which was Cornelis's debut as a maker of uh, films about big art exhibitions, then it would seem fair to point to the desire for controversy and the longing for being extremely critical. It would seem right to state that Cornelis intends to reveal the deceptive appearances of the art world. This concerns not only the two films I have introduced to you. It is also the case in the film about the 1971 edition of Tonsdale. In most of the longer documentaries about art exhibitions, Cornelis is critical, explicitly or implicitly, in a straight or in a clandestine way. Why then would he want to make these films at all? One might start to wonder. Does he care about art at all? I think these questions are relevant, taking into account what we have heard and what we have seen. But the answer to the questions might come as a complete surprise. Yes, he does. Yes, he does care about art, and I want to establish conclusive proof of this. In 1969, so one year after the Documenta 4 documentary, Jeff Cornelis was involved in setting up an alternative art space in Antwerp called A379089. The name of the initiative was chosen after the telephone number of the house, which was located in Beeldhouwerstraat 46 in Antwerp. A379089 was founded on May 24, 1969, at a party in the house of Dr. and Collector Hubert Peters. Jeff Cornelis was present at this party, as well as Georges Azé, a collaborator of Jeff Cornelis at that time. Who else were present? Uh, critic Geert Beekaert, with whom Cornelis produced most of the films about architecture and urbanism, architect René de Bont, the gallerists Angli Becker and the Derek Lohaus of the White House Space Gallery, the artist Marcel Brotaars and his wife Maria Hielsen, the collectors Easy Fishman, Herman Dallet and Martin Visser, and the German curator Kasper Koenig, who would become the artistic coordinator of the alternative art space. Critic Geert Beekaert wrote about A379089 even before the first activity of A was organized. In an article in the magazine PAABK, he wrote, and I quote, A will be an open house. It will go beyond the boundaries of the gallery. A chooses for creative experiment from whatever angle or discipline. In its manifesto, um, the founders of A state, and I quote, free use of all media, political, social, and psychological, more important than aesthetic questions. No boss, no jury, self-regulation. Coordinator for first six-month period. No limitation by moral politics. No autocratic people. No undemocratic groups. No foggy money manipulation. Teamwork. Participation in all political and cultural decisions. No subventions were asked. Everything was paid for by the founders who wanted to decide collectively and democratically about the policy of A. The first activity in A took place two months after the gathering at the house of Hubert Peters. On July 18, 1969, the initiators and guests met in A to celebrate the first moonwalk. On this date, indeed, two American astronauts landed on the moon. On the walls of A, 
paintings by A.R. Pank were attached. After this festive activity, A. organized an exhibition by Marcel Brotaars, namely the second version of his uh, Musée d'Art Moderne de Patrimoine des Aires, section du section 14, to the 17th century section of the Museum of Modern Art, Department of Eagles. Two other experiments implied the American artist James Lee Byers. The performance This is a Call from the Ghost of James Lee Byers, which took place eight days after the opening of Brotaars Museum. And the second project was of a bigger scale and was titled The World Question Center, a live television program initiated by James Lee Byers and made by director Jeff Cornelis in the premises of the Dutch language Belgian Public Television Corporation. A organized performances by La Monte Young and Marianne Vazela, jazz concerts, film screenings, an exhibition of Adi Kurte, Thomas Schmidt and Robin Page, a Fluxus concert by Ben Vautier, activities of Legal, the group around Jurek Immenburg, a lecture by Carl André, and A launched a remarkable campaign against racism in Antwerp. A also published the text Beware by Daniel Buren, an incredible lucid and radical text in which he pleads for a complete rupture with art. Jeff Cornelis was a very active and present member of the collective. He supported A financially. He programmed screenings of films, among others by Andy Warhol. He helped to set up the performances by La Monte Young and Marianne Vazela, and so on and so forth. He even was able to convince his bosses at the Public Television Corporation that the short film should be devoted to the opening of the 17th century section of the Museum of Modern Art, Department of Eagles of Marcel Brotaars. This film still exists, by the way, so it is the most precious proof of Cornelis's commitment. Despite the huge efforts, financially and otherwise, Cornelis and his friends were willing to pay. The adventure of A379089 didn't last very long. After eight months, it was over. In February 1970, the main financer, Izzy Fishman, a collector, handed over the keys to Panamarenko, who installed the studio in the premises in Beeldauerstraat 46. What had started as a collective, utopian and democratic endeavor ended in dissension, division and disagreement. The dream of a common project had turned into a complete failure. Now I go to the last chapter about Documentary 5. At the end of June 1972, less than one year and a half after the collapse of A379089, the exhibition Documenta 5 opened its doors. This edition was unlike all the previous ones. First of all, because Arnold Bode was no longer in charge of it. Harold Zeman was as general secretary, the actual leader of the exhibition, though he appointed numerous curators for parts of the show. Another striking difference with all the previous ones was the thematic approach. In 1968, the divisions were only media-based. Painting, sculpture, objects, notables, environment. In 1972, this method was completely abandoned. The subtitle of Documenta 5 ran like this, Questioning Reality, Pictorial Worlds Today. An incredible amount of these called uh, pictorial worlds were on display, like kitsch, publicity, social realism, political iconography, religious ethnological images, museums from artists, science fiction, individual mythologies, and the art of insane people. Documenta 5 offered a platform for the art of photorealism as well as for conceptual art, for Josef Beuys' Organization for Direct Democracy to plebiscite, as well as for Daniel Buren's pivotal intervention in all the exhibition venues. Zeeman also invited the artists who were not welcome at the previous edition. Fluxus and Happening were all over the place in Kassel in 1972. The film about Documenta 5 is divided into chapters as well. The division is though not very strict. After having introduced the overall concept of Documenta 5, the film deals with photorealism, then with kitsch, then with minimal and concept art, and with the so-called individual mythology. It is at this point that the excerpt starts uh, that I want to show, and it runs from this uh, part about individual mythologies until the end. 
Was meinen Sie mit einer politischen Aktion wie diese in einer Ausstellung wie Documenta? Dies ist keine politische Aktion an einem Tag, sondern ich bleibe hier 100 Tage. Diese politische Aktion ist äh, jetzt nicht zu verstehen wie eine politische Aktion außerhalb der Kunst, sondern mein Revolutionsmodell, nennen wir es einmal so, geht aus von der Kunst, von der Kreativität und Selbstbestimmung des Menschen. Nun muss man dazu die Formel nehmen, jeder Mensch ist Künstler. Also, dass die Selbstbestimmung möglich ist, dass man also eine Herrschaft, eine Scheindemokratie abschaffen kann, wenn jeder Mensch äh, Gebrauch macht von seiner Selbstbestimmungsmacht, die er hat und die ins Spiel bringt. Ja, das Wirtschaftliche ist ja sehr wichtig für die Menschen. Nur kämpfen wir für ein gerechtes wirtschaftliches Leben. Das heißt für einen wahren Sozialismus. Das heißt für eine gerechte Wirtschaftsordnung. Aber die haben wir ja noch nicht. Dafür müssen wir kämpfen. Ich weiß nicht, ob alle Künstler dafür kämpfen wollen, die auf der Dokumenta sind. Aber ich will es tun. Und vielleicht finde ich Bundesgenossen. Aber ich arbeite ja nicht nur mit Künstlern zusammen. Ich arbeite mit allen Menschen zusammen. Und dieses Büro ist ja nur eine Kopie von einem anderen Büro, was wir in der Straße haben, in Düsseldorf. Wir haben auch inzwischen schon eins in Neapel. Und wir wollen über die ganze Welt solche Büros aufmachen. Das ist unser Ziel. Nach Möglichkeit drei oder vier in jeder Stadt. Das ist die Idee. An artist like Boyce pretends he's using his status as an artist to preach democracy. Yeah, but that seems to be a pretty standard statement of most people when there is an attempt at imposition. I, I don't want to use words like fascist and left and right. But when there's an attempt at imposition mm. and the utilization of some sort of charisma to impose this thing, everybody is justifying it that if you make me king mm. for one day, mm. I will make you all kings the next day. But there's always the implication that this one person has to be king first. kan men als plastische kunstwerken bezien. Gebeurtenissen ook, of processen. Dit zijn bepaalde reekse ervaringen. Het zich bevinden in een welbepaalde ruimte is een dergelijk proces. Het vullen van een ruimte met een eindeloos zich herhalend verschijnsel eveneens. Een happening lijkt meer op een drama. Een proces daarentegen is een soort geleide ervaring waarbij de ruimtelijke dimensie ook een rol speelt. Afficher uh, mijn travail, de peinture dans euh, sept endroits différents, dans des sections différentes, euh, à travers euh, l'articulation la, la, de toute l'exposition entre les deux musées qui exposent, euh, qui sont documentaires. Unique, uniquement à l'intérieur Uniquement à l'intérieur. Parce que, euh, étant donné, je pense que cette exposition est caractéristique dans sa volonté, sinon dans son résultat, de sections séparées, euh, le passage d'une section à une autre, C'est un peu passé de l'intérieur à l'extérieur, à l'intérieur de l'ensemble global de l'exposition elle-même. Donc d'une section à une autre, on passe de l'intérieur à l'extérieur. Est-ce que les artistes ont accepté d'employer de, ton travail comme, comme toi le font Je dois dire que je ne l'aurais pas demandé. Il n'y a pas eu de problème en ce sens-là euh, Pour l'instant, jusqu'à présent, il n'y a pas eu de problème. Est-ce que c'est par modestie ou par quoi Pourquoi que tu as choisi des couleurs aussi neutres cette année-ci Je pense que les couleurs choisies sont théoriques et techniques en même temps. Pour, pour arriver à pouvoir euh, mettre sur pied euh, la réalisation de cette idée, il fallait absolument que le travail n'ait aucun, euh, aucune importance euh, visuelle, du moins aucune importance euh, réelle. Et pour ce faire, il fallait donc euh, choisir quelque chose de très très, euh, très, très neutre, très très doux, euh, et la seule façon de pouvoir arriver à cette euh, tonalité restreinte était évidemment de choisir un blanc sur blanc, qui d'ailleurs pose d'autres problèmes. Est-ce que le public ne va pas s'y méprendre Est-ce qu'il ne pourrait pas croire que c'est véritablement Ça ne fait rien. Je n'ai pas de document à 5, je dois, à, pour beaucoup de monde, un élément de stabilisation, et pour plusieurs artistes qui... Qui, qui se croient encore subversifs, se croient, qui sentent maintenant qu'il qu n'y a rien d'autre 
que de rester dans ce contexte muséal qui est le seul qui peut donner la signification à leur travail. Il reste le fait que c'est vous... Mais qui ça, avez... ça serait totalement idiot de le nier. Euh, et je crois que c'était dès le début, euh, j'ai demandé, je vais, je vais m'exiger euh, que j'ai cette compétence. Ça veut dire qu'on remplace un comité par, euh, par le fait qu'on me donne la responsabilité entière de faire cette exposition. Mais autrement, ce n'était pas possible pour moi. La démonstration est un petit peu parallèle à la démonstration faite par l'organisateur, c'est-à-dire Zeman. D'une certaine façon, le travail devient un petit peu partie du musée dans lequel on vient accrocher les œuvres d'art ou les gestes ou les, les présentations de musée, etc., etc. Tu as prétendu que Zeman a fait lui-même une grande œuvre, c'est bien ça Je pense que le documental est d'une façon caractéristique, ce que sont d'ailleurs quasiment toutes les expositions, surtout ces expositions de groupe, mais ici d'une façon très très visible, je pense, euh, l'œuvre d'Aral Zeman qui devient en fait l'artiste qui a créé cette, euh, cette énorme peinture qui se trouve être euh, l'exposition elle-même. Donc l'exposition, en fin de compte, c'est l'exposition de l'exposition. Et la valeur marchande, c'est une chose qui existe depuis, depuis très longtemps et c'est difficile de, de se débarrasser de, dans notre société telle qu'elle elle existe maintenant de la notion qu'un objet qui est rare a, a, a une valeur monétaire, la chance. Hein. Peut-être que tout ça va changer. Euh, même, on est en voie de changer ça. Mais pourtant, vous voyez, même ces artistes conceptuels qui sont à l'avant-garde de, de tout, qui même ont rejeté la notion traditionnelle de l'art, quand même, ils se font payer leurs œuvres. Ils doivent vivre. À mon grand étonnement, tous les artistes ici acceptent d'être mis dans des boîtes. Quelle boîte Chaque boîte, chaque salle est une boîte dans laquelle on donne une étiquette, dans laquelle on met un titre, on classe et on installe chacun au gré de cette boîte. C'est clair, un séminaire aurait été la forme la plus pure et qui correspondait en 70 le plus à la situation. Ça veut dire pas de visiteurs. Et naturellement, on a essayé maintenant, pendant ces deux ans, de garder ce caractère thématique de garder, de briser vraiment un peu les, disons, les notions de l'exposition d'art moderne, mais en même temps, on ne pouvait pas se passer des originaux pour avoir le caractère d'événement, pour attirer l'attention, mais naturellement toujours pour les mêmes 10% de visiteurs, sur le caractère didactique de l'exposition. On n'est toujours pas sorti euh, du 19e siècle et que nous sommes toujours dans le monde des images. L'art est toujours une, une série d'images, euh, qu'elles soient conceptuelles ou qu'elles soient hyper réalistes, et que chacun accroche son image, ce qui est un petit peu le sens de la démonstration que, fait, que je, je tente de faire, dans la mesure où on accroche une image sur quelque chose. C'est-à-dire que l'image se révèle vraiment en tant que telle. C'est du 19e siècle, ça ah, je pense que le euh, 19e siècle, c'est midi, c'est aussi le 20e, puisqu'on est presque à la fin du 20e. Je pense que bien qu'on tourne autour de ce problème depuis euh, oui. presque une centaine d'années, oui. il n'est pas du tout encore posé clairement. Oui, est on est vrai. toujours encore au niveau de l'image et de la métaphore. Oui, la métaphore existe aussi dans le sens, par exemple, assez intéressant et en même temps très critiquable, des musées qui s'exposent dans le musée. De théorie van Documenta 5 is wellicht banco. Verward en verwarrend. Daarbij komt dat men, zelfs indien men in de afbeelding van de werkelijkheid een zeker kritiek op deze werkelijkheid wil tonen, de hele vraagstelling omtrent de politieke betekenis van de kunst min of meer bewust heeft uitgesloten. Ten slotte biedt Documenta 5 alleen maar een kleurrijk overzicht van de meest recente artistieke producten. De productie zelf van deze voorwerpen en de consumptie ervan moeten bezoekers zelf maar beschrijven en beoordelen. Dit was een film van Georges Adé, Romain Korovits, Jeff Cornelis, Fred de Walen, Gust Malfried, Guido van Rooij en Pieter Verlinde. Programmatie Ludo Beckers, productie Jérôme Verhagen. So when we compare this excerpt with the two previous ones, 
we can't but establish striking similarities. We find this same critical attitude. If we just remember the last words of the, of the film, um, after all, Documenta 5 offers only a, a colorful overview of the most recent artistic products. While these sentences are being pronounced by the off-screen voice, we see again the big poster which we saw at the beginning of this excerpt. It is the poster which is in the space occupied by Josef Beuys during his stay of 100 days at Documenta 5. At the start of the excerpt, while Josef Beuys is being interviewed, the poster seems to confirm Beuys' statement about stopping a mock democracy, about self-determination, about a just economy, about a true socialism. At the end of the excerpt, which is also the end of the film, Beuys' poster is shown again, right on the moment when the voiceover claims that the whole issue of art's political significance has been more or less consciously excluded in Documenta 5. This is one of the typical tropes in Cornelius' oeuvre. Sound and image do not always match, or better, sound and image might oppose each other, producing an uncanny form of criticism. As I've said, this critical attitude is the link between the three excerpts. But there are also huge differences between the film about Documenta 4 on the one hand and the film about Documenta 5 on the other. First of all, there is no voiceover in the film about Documenta 4, while there is one in the film about Documenta 5. Secondly, we are not only able to see the reporter, we are also allowed to hear his questions. When Jeff Cornelis produced the film about Documenta 5, uh, sorry, when Jeff Cornelis produced the film about Documenta 4, he was forced to collaborate with Karel Gerland, a Ghent-based lawyer and the president of the Association for a Museum of Contemporary Art in Ghent, the current SMAC. So it was Gerland, who, not Cornelis, who took the initiative to make the film about Documenta 4. I have found evidence of this in the archives of the Flemish Public Television Corporation. I would suggest that Cornelis did make the film he wanted to make about Documenta 4, but in order to do so, he had to cut out as much as possible, if not entirely, Gerland's questions and remarks. And he couldn't allow him to write the texts for a voiceover. The film about Documenta 5 was in the hands of Jeff Cornelis from the very start, and he was able to draw in his good friend, George Ade, an Antwerp-based writer, novelist, critic, and, let us not forget, Cornelis' fellow in A279089. Both men had collaborated a number of times. They made a long film about Zosbeek Beyond the Law and Order in 1971, and he had also produced a lengthy list of short films about artists and exhibitions. In short, there was common ground between Abe and Cornelis. We have been able to find out what the collaboration between Cornelis and Abe did result in. We have, for instance, heard Joseph Beuys claiming that he fights for a just economy, and then adding, I don't know if all the artists here want to fight for it. So while Beuys is devoted to a true socialism on the one hand, he points to some of his colleagues at Documenta who would not want to fight for it. Beuys' speech is followed by a question of George Ade to Lawrence Wigny, and I quote, an artist like Beuys pretends he's using his status as an artist to preach democracy and so on. We remember Wiener's answer. There's always the implication this one person has to be king first. So Beuys and Wiener may never have talked with each other about their dissenting views, and Wiener may never have talked about it when he wouldn't have been asked about it. The opposition between the two is staged by Ade and Cornelis. The film about Documenta 5 is a succession of these kind of oppositions or disputes that maybe had lain dormant, but flared up uh, at uh, Abdes and Cornelis' instigation. At the end of the film, we encounter an unexpected trio, composed of the hypercritical artist Daniel Duren, the down-to-earth gallerist Lier Costelli, and the pragmatic curator Harold Zeman, who already at the very beginning of the film had stated that both the Documenta Urbana, the dream of Arnold Bode, and the Documenta Seminaire, the idea of Eberhard Gogler, had been set aside 
because tickets needed to be sold, at least 250,000, and that this goal couldn't be reached with two radical concepts. At the end of the film, Daniel Buren explains his critical contribution to Documenta 5. With his intervention, he says, he aims to reveal the all too dominant role of the curator, Harald Zeeman. Buren's statement is followed by an interview with Zeeman, who says, it would be ridiculous to deny it. I demanded that I have that power. Again, Buren is given the opportunity to explain his work, and he basically repeats what he had already said. Now his saying is followed by an interview with the art dealer Leo Castelli, who states, but even these conceptual artists who are avant-garde, who have rejected traditional notions of art, they still get paid for their work, they have to live. The disagreement between the three characters couldn't be more suffocating. There is no way out of this firm triangle. One of the most charismatic exhibition makers, one of the most radical artists and one of the most successful gallerists have each other in a stranglehold. If we compare the start of the film of Documenta 4 with the end of the film of Documenta 5, we have to come to the conclusion that the criticality has imploded. It goes in all directions or in no specific direction at all. While in 1968 a portrait was made of a group of artists, and I think this is really important. It starts with a group of artists who are protesting. We only face individual artists who harshly criticized each other in 1972. While in 1968 a bunch of French artists has given, was given a lot of television time and Jean Lering was asked to react to their protest, we only meet artists who are attacking each other or the curator in 1972. Georgia Day and Jeff Cornelis had been part of the Alternative Art Center A27909, of which the foundation was based upon the principles of self-regulation, participation and democracy. Only eight months after the start of A, Georgia Day and Jeff Cornelis had been, had, been, had been witnesses of the total collapse of the endeavor and the falling apart of the as diverse, as terrific group of people. They had been part of a project which claimed to be self-regulated, democratic, and certainly un-autocratic, uh, but they had seen how it completely failed. Is this an explanation for the attitude of the two television makers in 1972? I would suggest to consider this way, but I can't prove it. What is though sure is that after the film about Documenta 5, Jeff Cornelis stopped making films about big art exhibitions for a very long time. Thank you very much, Kuhn. Um, and would you like to join us uh, at the table? A very concentrated portrayal, actually, of the state of affairs I think we experienced in the last uh, session. We and now better. Better? I think this one's Kevin, huh? Keeping it exciting. Better? Yeah. Okay. Um, Adam, would you perhaps have an initial reaction or? Uh, yeah, but too many, probably. Right. Well, um, one thing, just as a quick comment, I don't think it's necessary to, uh, go into his history to prove that he likes art, because obviously he's a filmmaker who's obviously in love with film, so he is an artist, and I think that's an important uh, distinction. Um, but uh, more importantly, I, I had a really interesting question, uh, interesting for me, and I don't know if it's because of the translator, because of the title, but um, Documenta is supposed to be lowercase, and it alternates throughout the films as uppercase and lowercase. Do you know what the official titles of the film are? And do you know why they kept on changing the D? There's a reason for this, so I'll get there. <laughs> um, the, the documentaries didn't have a title. Mm. So they were broadcast as 
a program about Documenta 4, a program about Documenta 5. Mm. So they, I mean, when, and this is also, uh, the, let's say, already uh, I mean, uh, maybe a remark about your first uh, statement, um, Jeff Cornelis never considered him to be an artist. He considered himself to be a filmmaker, yes. Mm. Um, I mean, he, he has always kept the difference very clear. Mm. And um, at the public broadcasting company, this was seen like this as well. Mm. So it meant they were not considered authors. Mm. Um, although he, he is an author, I think. But, mm. uh, they were not considered author, and the, 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 the work they did was not considered to be um, more than a sort of documentation. Mm. Mm. It's clearly something different. Mm. But um, this was clearly re reflected in the fact that when the programs were announced, they didn't have a title. Mm. Mm. And it was just like a film about Documenta 4. Mm. There is also no title which we can see in the film. Mm. Mm. The film starts without title because that's how it was um, conceived of by the corporation. Mm. Mm. No, I mean, I, br I bring it up um, because uh, Boda intentionally titled Documenta with a lowercase d, where in German it should be an uppercase d. And that was meant by him, and this gets into questions of the symbolic, to uh, make the exhibition more humble. Uh, in that the fact that it shouldn't be capitalized like proper nouns are in German, and it was a way to sort of de uh, take out the ego, let's say, of the exhibition. Ironically, an exhibition that's posed in 1955 as the savior of the return of German culture and the, and the uh, crux of the free world versus the communist world doesn't seem very uh, unegoistic to me. <laughs> Uh, which uh, leads me to uh, the next question, which is interesting, you know, how, um, you know, you say that, and it's true, much of the film isn't really concerned with the art objects as such. And there's a concept in literary criticism called intentional fallacy. And intentional fallacy is wherein a critic disregards anything that the artist claims the work's about, and that the work has different receptions in the world independent of what the author says. And that might be contradictory. Uh, the reason why I bring that up is because most of... I was lucky enough to actually catch the Documental 4 film in the middle. And by catching it in the middle, I saw the epilogue. And the epilogue basically states that what one would argue Documenta is and then says what it's not. So it puts at the forefront the idea that the rhetoric and the exhibition itself might not be the same thing. And uh, I'm wondering if uh, maybe you can comment on that more about not only that, but possibly just the role of instrumentalization in general, and what would then be possibly the instrumentalization of making a film about Documenta the Exhibition as a phenomenon and not Documenta the Exhibition as a display of art. So first of all, I have also instrumentalized by choosing these three excerpts, um, uh, both in, in the film about Documenta 4, I mean, in all three films, uh, there are uh, artworks being um, uh, shown mm. uh, in the Documenta 4 as well as in Documenta 5. Artists are commenting upon their works. Uh, I've chosen the, these excerpts, of course, with a clear goal. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, and through choosing these excerpts, it, uh, it, uh, I emphasize, let's say, the controversial nature of the enterprise of Jeff Cornelis. Mm -hmm. um, so this is... I, th I think the first thing I should say, because it's 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 not like this is, um, especially not for Documenta 4 and Documenta 5, it's not like it's a, 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 a succession of only these kind of uh, fragments, but they are the, the the red thread. I mean, in the Documenta 4 film, the protesters are the red, it's one of the red threads in the film, mm. and then constantly the reactions of the exhibition makers about it. Mm. As in the Documenta 5, let's say, the, the opposition between the artists is really... Uh, at the heart of the film. Mm. Mm. So um, I think that by saying this, I, I think that it was right to choose these excerpts, but it's mm. also a form of instrumentalization. Right. Right. When you say that um, in, in the beginning that um, uh, Jeff Cornelis is an artist because uh, he, he has a specific uh, style, he has a specific way of approaching the art, that's true. Um, but I think that the, the, the main aim of, of uh, his work in the at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, has been to be as critical as possible. And my my statement is that this ends into an implosion of the of the criticality in the Documenta 5 film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because I mean, when you especially 
not so much because we have the succession Buren Zeeman, but especially because we have this sudden appearance of the gallerist. Mm. But basically what the gallerist says is these people also only work for food. Mm -hmm. And this is, I mean, it's a truly killing statement. Mm -hmm. When you, at first we have the, the explanation of what Buren thinks he's doing, mm. and uh, Zeeman reacting to that mm. in, in a way, mm. then uh, having mm. the, the, the gallerist stating that uh, it's just a matter of survival mm -hmm. or, or earning earning money mm -hmm. basically so mm -hmm. this is the i think the, the moment when the the criticality really implodes mm -hmm. so this is the moment in the in the fourth from Manila and the gallery is present in the second page of the book that in the actual vision of the young artist in his life and this book on the production of art and the production of the ultimately art value which he is very representative of his character but he does uh, note in the beginning of the Tensions between the American artist and the larger spaces making more of the product in the American level versus the European artist who has a more grounded level of power. So here the gallerist, you would argue, then is more in service or more, more as a facilitator rather than this, I hope we can say, straightforward realist, yeah. having given up to the position of the artist. Um, I would say that when Castelli, in the beginning of the we are still talking about Castelli. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Castelli is in, indeed introduced in the beginning of the film, and he then says, "Okay, uh, conceptual art is can only be sold in Europe." Mm. That's what he said. And uh, in America, it's very difficult. Although by that time he had been dealing with the conceptual artists, since Zibelan had given up his business mm. and had transferred all his artists to Castelli around that period. Um, but suppose you would have you we would have had. The comment of Castelli about Europeans buying conceptual art at the end of the film, instead of at the beginning of the film, we have a we have a completely different ending. And, I mean, and this is the way Jeff Cornelis is, is working. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has chosen to put, let's say, the, the the praise of Castelli in favor of the conceptual artist at the beginning of the film, and the the really problematic sentence about conceptual art as being also just a commodity in a way. Uh, at the end of the film, mm -hmm. and this is this is really uh, what um, uh, what is at stake in, in Cornelius's film. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a question for both of you actually, because I think one of the differences between the two films, when you mention this level of criticality, um, you could say that uh, an implosion takes place at the end, at least in the very least, the way that Cornelius uh, displays it mm -hmm. in the movie himself. But there is also, uh, I think, a great difference in the language used when discussing art and when discussing the system, when discussing the positions of an artist, or the curator, or the gallery, or the exhibition itself, there is a lot more... Right. Was I completely mute the whole time? No. <laughs> no, that's good. Like this? So there's a, there's a question of language, I think, that also plays a, a very important role between these two films. There's a lot more jargon, if I may call it that, in Document the Five film. The Lawrence Wiener uh, especially has a very sort of high level of discourse that he uses in explaining his own work and the positions of other artists. But in being critical, actually, of artworks themselves, when at the same time you could say there is an implosion of that criticality. And what do you think maybe took place between 68 and 72 that results in, in this sort of enhanced uh, language or the, the enhanced discourse? Because as far as I'm concerned, there really is a big difference. Yeah, um, maybe I can answer this question by referring to Annie de Decker. Uh, Annie de Decker was the gallerist of Boys, Buren, uh, as well as Wiener in, in Antwerp, the White White Space Gallery. And uh, I had a talk recently with her and she said, uh, you know, uh, when we met Joseph Boys, he was not eloquent at all. He couldn't talk. He basically, he couldn't say what he was doing. He was a kind of mute person. He learned to talk. What we have seen at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, is with the emergence of the conceptual artists, language became a primary tool for these artists. And persons like Boyce became uh, much more uh, aware of their charisma and uh, about the reason to, uh, to speak. So this might be one of the explanations. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can... No, I mean, that's kind of where I was going with the discussion of rhetoric. Um, and I, it, it, it's interesting that it's not in the film. The gesture of honey on a microphone, I think, is a very obvious one. <laughs> um, and, I mean, to be 
be a little acronistic and jump around because we did have this morning and I know we're going um, uh, to discuss more about these kind of lines in uh, the next session is there was an essay recently published called There's No Place Like Home by Andrea Frazier in the Whitney Biennial. And she brought up, um, which is interesting too, because she's represented by Petzl and she's also one of the flag bearers of the Whitney program. So there's a contradiction. And it was her contribution to the Biennial. Correct? Uh, yes. Um, that's a longer conversation. Okay. Um, but basically what it does is it, it delineates a certain set of affairs, uh, which let's say this was the beginning of and maybe uh, where we are headed or where we are now, in which she said there's a divide between two aspects of art. There's art as a commodity that's bought and sold and traded, and that's a reality. Uh, good or bad is another question but it is fundamentally that, and that has to be acknowledged. And that also at the same time, that has developed its own life in the world, wherein galleries, auction houses, etc., have developed their own systems, structures, and whatever to maintain that position. Simultaneous to that, she said that with the rise of this sort of discursive, as, as we now call it, uh, and this brings back the idea of education, which I think is incredibly pertinent, that uh, MFA programs, PhD programs, magazines, and curators are responsible for creating the rhetoric that sees art as a different thing, as a place for you know anything you want, uh, potentiality, speculation, subjectivity, et cetera, et cetera. And that that field in itself has also developed its own structures, uh, the universities, which I've said. And that um, what's happened is both of these things this is not Andrea, this is my interpretation. Both of these things might be a reality, but they're separating from each other vastly while they're getting more powerful simultaneously. And um, you know, to bring that back into Documental 5, it's, it's very funny that we keep on talking about things that happened 20 years ago, and we had the credit crisis in 2008 and everyone wanted to make comparisons to the 1930s. That's kind of wrong. We're not in the 1930s. The thing we're closest to is the 1970s, uh, which precedes this 20 years we're talking about, which Documental 5 is part of. Um, and what you have at this time period, ironically, the same time you have arguments of the dematerialization of art, you have the dematerialization of money, wherein money was originally tied to things like gold. Then a guy named Nixon came around uh, with a guy named Milton Friedman, amongst others who was disillusioned with a breakdown of a system that happened after World War II called the Benton Woods uh, banking system and said, well, money is whatever we say it is. Um, so I, just to bring that into the conversation too, I think both four and five is really at this precipice in which um, all social structures, including our art system, our art rhetoric, but as well as our financial systems really have been playing out. And, um, Come to Documenta 13. And um, just kidding. Uh, what's, uh, what's really interesting now is by way of archaeology, after 30 years of experience of this creation of these structures and systems, to really look both at their origins and where we're going now. And I think um, by way of preview, just to say we're Documenta 13, I would highly recommend keeping a lot of these ideas from 1970 and many of the quotes directly in mind if you do come visit. And uh, I was going to use a French quotation, but I'm not going to. <laughs> you could argue that Andrea, in her, in her piece, she does argue for sort of the middle ground between these two extremes. Um, there was a, an essay written for the Documenta 11 catalog by Jean Fisher, The Metaphysics of Shit, where she talks about the position of the trickster, mm -hmm. the artist as being a, that intermediary that's hard to, to nail down. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that, that, that there is some kind of, I mean, you could say money is whatever we say it is, mm -hmm. art is whatever we say mm -hmm. it, it is, and it deals with the same value system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. An artist can break through that by mm -hmm. undermining it. I mean, let's say Jeff Cornelis as a filmmaker I think definitely made a very valid and noble attempt at that. And perhaps even succeeded. But how do you see that today, translating that to today? Well, um, good question. A, a big question, but um, I would say that the threat of the the whole 
may, maybe someone also to your question, but I have to say this: uh, the the threat of the academization um, mm -hmm. is uh, a m much bigger problem mm -hmm. than uh, the the marketing. And how do you mean that exactly? Academization? Well, it will as we see. I mean, in the, therefore, it's good that we have the films before us. Mm. Um, we have been learning how to cope with the market in in a way, I th I, I think. And uh, this morning, Stefano said, "Okay, you have to play." Try to play within the, the system if you can't try to develop something outside of it. I mean, because we have so much experience, even before 68, uh, we know how to do that. Um, or there are all kinds of alternatives that, that, that are being, uh, that have been tested or can be tested. The problem with the um, academization uh, or universitarization of uh, art production is that it indeed it is a parallel world, a parallel world, which um, is uh, entirely on its own, and um, so art culture rather than art as culture. Yes, okay. and I, 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 I don't want to be part of that, and um, uh, I really detest it. Okay, and so if Chef Cornelis should emerge again as a filmmaker, he might be. I'm, I would suggest that he make a film about that. Mm, right. Mm. Yeah, I mean the really interesting thing, and I, as by way of disclosure, I am a teacher and one of the creators of the school of Documenta Thirteen, and uh, an interesting thing is Documenta Four, uh, which they address in the film to some degree. The point of it was to then show contemporary artists, and it's also the first exhibition where they then make a school to teach you what contemporary art is. So it becomes, you know, it becomes both the study model. And I don't even know what that's called. <laughs> no, but, uh, just to, to re react immediately, I, th I think that uh, it's better to start new schools mm -hmm. on, a, on an entirely uh, um, in, uh, in an entirely different way than uh, education is now being organized by universities. Mm -hmm. This can be done at Documenta or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I think this is more important than to try to get into that suffocating system of the universities for the moment. Mm -hmm. And when we say new schools, uh, I mean, you see uh, Documenta indeed has it. And under mm -hmm. your guidance, and mm -hmm. you have the manifesta will also be organizing different educational programs. Mm -hmm. Institutions are organizing more and more educational programs. A lot of because of the budget cuts here in the Netherlands, a lot of money is now being sought through educational means mm -hmm. rather than artistic or productional uh, funding mm -hmm. and subsidies. I mean, what what? I read it's maybe a big question, but what, what can that actually lead to? Are we are we educating an audience to better understand art? Or educating an audience to better understand what you can actually do uh, with art, mm. because then you need the institutions to go with them, you need artists to go with them as well. Uh, I mean, it's for example, at the uh, documenta, what's your yeah? Aim? I mean, it's it's very tricky. Um, I'm actually trained in philosophy and actually Greek philosophy, and I'm much more in this kind of mindset of uh, you know things are themselves and their opposite simultaneously. Uh, just like how art is a commodity and art is a thing that we can psychologically turn into a cipher or whatever you want to call it. Um, or as a more simple and base metaphor, a car is something that can get you here and there and can create the society we have today. It can also kill you. Um, and, you know, I think a school is that and I think large exhibitions are that. And this is kind of the complexity of something like what Boys is, is proposing is when you actually are doing politics, you have to get into real politics. And real politics is incredibly dirty. And there is no black and white. And within that, you really have to seriously gauge your ethical standard because you constantly make compromises and you have to weigh what the compromise is. So, for example, you may take dirty money, but you might use it to a good end. Is that valid? Is the question. Um, and similarly with schools and setting up schools and specifically, you know, in this course, I think one of the things that may be missing, which I think, uh, Jeff, let's say, because I like him, <laughs> is trying to do is really bring back a certain idea of skepticism and a certain idea of self-criticism, uh, in which, you know, the why question is very hardly asked when we, when we do projects. A lot of times we ask the how, you know, where's the money from, blah, 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 how do we get this here? Very infrequently we ask the why. And I think the more problematic question then is to what end? And who are you, you know, like Boy said, you know, and not even to talk about what Larry said, but, um, you know, yes, you are, let's say on the good side, Boy is creating this sort of 
100 days of revolutionary democracy, someone did pay for that. And where that money came from may not exactly match the rhetoric. Does that mean you shouldn't do it? Who knows? Does that mean someone doesn't go to it and becomes, you know, a revolutionary? Who knows? You know? So I think, you know, these, these are really the questions. And I think it, it really fu uh, needs to boil down to, and this is why I get into the rhetoric. I mean, rhetoric's great, but at the end of the day, you have to ask very simple questions such as why, to what end, you know, things like that. And I think that gets missed when you exaggerate the scale of things. And this could be one of the problems of academicization is the movement into rhetorics and jargon as opposed to just simple, fundamental, philosophical, ethical questions. Maybe an example, we didn't mention it this morning, but I mean, I think it can't be ignored. We have to discuss it somehow. Um, if you see Harold Seymour in 72, he sort of becomes the birth of the curator. Now, I don't think we should fall into a discussion on the difference between curator and artist and the, and the changing rules, but that did lead to uh, this kind of authorship, uh, which uh, reached a very interesting point, I think, a couple of weeks ago with the opening of the Berlin Biennial. Uh, in that sense, I mean, here you have uh, an artist uh, collaboratively with others, but uh, conceiving a, a certain project, which was very much aimed at beginning a new form of generating knowledge hmm. and active, uh, being politically active, whether that's a political act, I think that's a, that's a larger discussion. But hmm. um, at the same time, there was the gallery opening of the gallery weekend in Berlin. You had this very weird uh, sort of two events going on at once, BMWs driving through streets where punkers and occupiers were, were walking around. Hmm. Um, and it didn't seem to, sh to rule each other out, but it certainly didn't get along as well. Mm. I mean, if I'm cynical, do you th cynically speaking, is that, a, is, that a, is that a future? Or is, what, what kind of result can, can, that, lead, can that lead to? <laughs> if Jeff Cornelis were to be there and to, to film this, do you... Do you I don't want to speculate. <laughs> okay. I mean, it just, but, but, uh, but I think it's interesting to think. Uh, yes, yes, I, but I, I think it's not the future. I mean, you were there, you have seen it, we right. are in it. Right. And so, um, but I rather have this kind of heterogeneous mm. context, diverse context, mm -hmm. than, uh, than a system that only believes in itself and that you, uh, you have to be a believer and then you're in and if you don't believe, you're out. Mm. I, I, I rather have this kind of very diverse situations mm. um, than uh, these monolithic mm -hmm. um, uh, power blocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and taken from the film too, there's an obvious dialectic going on in the film, and you can't have that without contradiction. Mm -hmm. So if you have a homogenous society, what kind of thoughts are you going to make? Mm -hmm. um, questions yeah. from the audience? Yes. Now, what we found 
how do we start to do it? We want to be parallel to the general community. We've got so many threats of community that we want to see the world change. I haven't said this, huh? what, yeah. that there is one system. I haven't said this, no. Yeah. Um, I, um, I Basically, I agree with you, except for the fact that I didn't say what you're saying that I said. Um, the, the, what, what I'm, though, criticizing uh, is, the, is, the, is the way uh, we are dealing with education right now and the way art has been swallowed by the university system. And I think this is indeed a parallel world, and it's a, it's a much, as far as I'm concerned, it's much less interesting. It's less in interesting than the real art world. It's parallel to the real art world. And, uh, but um, uh, I don't think that something interesting is happening there. But uh, it consists of a, of, a, of, a, of a system of believers. And if you don't believe, you, you, uh, you're, 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 you're ejected of that. I mean, this was the problem that I wanted to add to the problem of the market that we have been discussing this morning. I, I think that it is good to discuss the problem of the market. But I think that we have much more uh, experience in dealing with that. For instance, in setting up all kinds of different systems, in, in which I also believe that this is the, the reality. The reality is not that there's only one art market. No, there is a lot. There is a lot going on. The problem is, though, and this was also pointed uh, to by somebody, that in terms of media attention, indeed, we we we, we receive the impression that only this kind of uh, top. Art world is the only art world. Hmm. I don't know whether I. No, I mean that that's completely on point. I mean, uh, it's a distinction I've actually heard uh, Graeber talk about, where there's two terms that usually are used for capitalism. One is pervasive, and the other one is dominant. And they're two different terms. Pervasive would mean that there is one system. Dominant means there's one system standing over all the other systems, and that's actually what we have. As you know, you, what one percent, the top tens, whatever you want to call it, the Hearsts, whatever, they are dominant over pervasive system, other systems. Uh, the question, though, and this is why Stefano's work is so important, is how are they dominant? And tracing those things is only going to unroot that. And the question is, I mean, dominance is a pretty serious, heavy word, and they're very dominant and they're very entrenched. Uh, this doesn't mean there's a way out. There's not a way out of it. It means there's a lot of work to get out of it. Uh, and this is what, and one of the good things about a school, if it's working properly, is it can expose these things and 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 show you how to un undo them. And more importantly, uh, it shows it can help you to not set them back up again, which is a mistake that we always make. And. In terms of, I mean, this is knowledge we're talking about. Yeah. Being well informed, uh, curators, artists, directors should all be aware of these statistics. Should all be aware of how these uh, this domination uh, is is formed. Mm -hmm. Is that something they should be aware of from their position as as an individual, as an as a, as a thinking human being? Mm -hmm. Because I think one of the problems that you found there after the budget cuts here is the position that the artist must take, not from his or her work, although there are a lot of artists whose work uh, lends itself. To, to be political and to take this protest, mm. um, but from their their position as an artist mm. uh, and or someone's position as a curator, mm. you could say the gray area begins where these two sort of leak into each other. Mm. Mm. Is that a problem? I mean, at all? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would I would like to expand it out a little to stop with these distinction of artists and non-artists and things like that. Right. Um, basically everything we've been talking about to sum down into two words is that there is a collusionary force and there's a co uh, consolidation happening, right? And both of those things, the collusion would be, you know, the, the getting together of five or six people who quite literally create systems and structures to maintain their dominance. And the way that they do that is they put everything together so they deny access to it. Uh, and you create, to make it simply, an irrational ratio, one to 100 or something. And, uh... You know, we as as individuals over our history have not liked lopsided things, and this is where our ethics says that this is wrong, right? And the sad thing is, if you look around everywhere, this consolidation is the dominant thing. It's uh, you know, there's a there's very few banks in the world, there's very few uh, education systems anywhere. Uh, the access to images is limited. The access to the internet is now getting limited, and I think it's important not for an artist to you know argue about the cuts as such they have to argue about it in the larger uh, uh ecosystem you know what is 
these cuts, and I'm, I'm speaking from America's standpoint, I don't know so much about the Dutch standpoint, and America is really the hyper model of all of this. Um, you know, if you don't have solidarity with the cuts in for the American model with healthcare, the cuts with education, the cuts for almost everything, uh, you know, that I think that's a much better way to pose it to say that this is part of a much larger issue. And these cuts are only symptomatic of a general tendency for certain people to take power in general. Cool. Do you want to add to that? Um, maybe to add, and uh, because I know much more about the Dutch uh, situation than you, that uh, I don't understand the general apathy in Holland. I think this is for me the basic question. Um, uh, Measures have been announced, um, and um, they are incredibly tough. And basically, there has been one symbolic action, and after this uh, had been uh, terminated, uh, all the decisions were taken, and uh, it will have huge effects upon the whole the whole uh, system. It will have a huge effect on everybody who deals with art, artists, art critics, curators, museums, uh, kunsthal, et and so forth. And basically, there has been a general apathy. Mm -hmm. And this uh, uh, I completely don't understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, to return to the Documenta 4 movie, in the beginning, the artists who were protesting and actually pulled out, do you see, is that is that something you're alluding to? Um, it's stepping out of... Or is it no, actually no, no, stepping no. In I think that we, um, uh, I don't understand that um, all these players, and we are, there are a lot of people involved in the art world in Holland, um, that there hasn't been uh, the possibility to um, really work together, to collaborate, to undo these measures. I mean, I have given a speech um, 100 meters further away, the boy month then, and my statement was, this should be undone. I still think this. It, it should be a year ago. It, yes, to death. it should be undone. And everybody uh, I met is very pragmatic. Either there is no reaction, it's apathy, or either there is um, a pragmatic solution, which is fighting for themselves. Everybody's got to work. Death. You have to earn a living, like Leo. No, 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 but you, you won't be. You, you won't be. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. the people who believe that they can do it for themselves mm -hmm. are simply wrong. Mm -hmm. And this will this will be the, the final result, which we will which we will finally grow to to the period uh, at the end of 2016, that everything has been fallen apart, and that uh, in, in, instead that a few individuals have been able to survive, that nobody survived. Mm -hmm. This is my position on, uh, about it. So it's a very relevant question because it matters the situation here and now in Holland. Um, there's some, unless you want to react, I'm no, 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 we shouldn't talk at all. But, um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
A real alternative? You understand? Well, um, if, if if a lot of things happen, then uh, I excuse myself. But I thought it not so much has happened. Sorry, I mean, uh, no, 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 no. Well, um, I give my uh, I give you my impression. And uh, I think that um, maybe on an individual level, maybe in short or in, 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 in small circles, something happened that has escaped my attention. But uh, it certainly hasn't grown from that. And this is this is, no, this is really this is really problematic. I mean, um, if we know that um, the, the the government itself has uh, estimated that uh, twelve thousand people will be unemployed in the cultural sector. Um, many more people are, are uh, threatened uh, via other ways. I mean, why then? It, it, has, it hasn't been possible to make it, to, to turn it into a movement that, that would grow. I'm not going to close the door in this discussion because it's coming back in, in I think, in, in the last part of, of the day. Uh, and I think you two maybe should take a walk together, if you give me. <laughs> There's a question over here. Do you think uh, you would think in our sort of post-Fordist age, though, that that the field of arts and culture would be more, perhaps, uh, more adept at creating that visibility in an alternative uh, way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, if I may, because I think it's important that we're here together in this discussion, would you mind just introducing yourself? Okay. Mm -hmm. And for everybody who makes a comment, just shortly your name. It would be nice, you know, if afterwards we're in a conversation together, we know who we are. There's a question up there. Uh, in addition <laughs> to, this, uh, to this discussion, uh, this morning there was a very uh, beautiful quotation about precariousness, and um, it's, I wish I could um, say it again, uh, literally, but um, as I can paraphrase it a little bit, it, um, it's um, described precariousness uh, as a situation where, it's, um, where it cannot be addressed, where it has to be acknowledged, where it has to be spoken to, and, um, and um, yeah, where it has to be... Uh, uh, in, in a conversation, and I think also with the um, uh, with the gathering of people and the slow growth uh, and organization, this should also be uh, acknowledged. And I think one of the dangers is that when people speak to um, big gatherings of people and say, "Well, the only thing I've seen is apathy, and there was no organization at all," this puts this gathering in a very precarious situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm Samuel. I, I work at the directory um, because we are now talking about issues of I mean, the media intervention, uh, apathy, um, information, schooling, and I'd like to link this back to the work of Chef Cornel, which, if I understood correctly, has been shown on the DRT, the, the um, Flemish public television. I mean, I'm from Belgium, I can say that this is not being shown anymore <laughs> on the Belgian television whatsoever. Um, and as you pointed out so nicely, that this is such a smart, intelligent way of covering these uh, issues, so well edited. Um, could it be that we are also lacking this today, of uh, general media who are trying to give another uh, point of view, or assigning intelligent people to uh, cover these issues? Mm -hmm. So I think, or are there people um, that are doing this, but are just not getting the platform, or is there just a general lack of... Can I react to that? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, Barbara Fischer, a uh, visual artist and <laughs> also a filmmaker. Uh, I've been asked to make a film about the art group. Uh, I think it's too big an issue, really, to address at once. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I look at uh, the films of Jeff Cornelius with great interest. Uh, also thinking of what one would do differently today. Um, I think it, when, when it, going back to the, to the subsidy uh, quote of uh, Jean van Heeswijk, I was never really ashamed of getting subsidized. It's, I, I think it was, uh, it was fantastic. Uh, but I did feel, and that's why my protest, as maybe some others, was I just I did the march, but uh, uh, not much more than that. Um, I think it was also because the atmosphere was as such that uh, that it created a kind of um, impotence, um, and it relates, I think, to what you said about that it seems to be only about the how and not about the why. And I see that when, uh, when you make a film and you have to deal with networks, with uh, lawyers, with producers, they constantly ask why, 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 why? And that was very challenging and uh, also a very good experience. Very critical uh, from all types of uh, fields. But I, I, I felt much more recognized somehow because the why question was so uh, present. Um, so, um, well, this doesn't lead to a question. <laughs> 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 I, I, I just want to can I, can I yeah. ask you, because I, very much, I think one of the problems or one of the issues that is being brought to the table now uh, is that yes, enough or not enough protest or not enough activity from the art world, etc. I, I so much agree with what you said that actually the whole problematics of cuts is not, let's say, subsidy cuts for the arts and how that affects our personal lives, or how that affects our institutions, or how it affects that we don't work together or not being able to work at all, I don't know, you know? 
Well, I think it's really, really important, and that's, I think, what's missing in all these um, factors of really appreciating capitalism, is the realization, really, and not only the realization of the European Union principles, but the realization of actually that this is part of something larger. Mm -hmm. So what I missed in the march, for example, in the Netherlands, and what I uh, missed also in the march of the, of the artists in the Netherlands, but also in the march of the health workers in the Netherlands, it was different marches, and they were taking place on safe places outside the parliamentary grounds, you know, they were taking place on safe green grass fields just behind the station where everybody can pass. And I think if, if something changed, maybe that demonstration was totally out of uh, action. Anyway, I think so, maybe, perhaps, but we should find other ways of getting all these parties together. Mm -hmm. All these parties that are part of something larger, but larger is not basically have not. Mm -hmm. So we have to find ways of saying that and speaking not only to each other within the arts world, and we, that we mostly, I would say, still have to go by this view for most part of it, but I think it has to sort of step out forward. Now, if I could add that there are unique circumstances in terms of education, uh, psychiatric care, the, the, the field of culture, the defense ministry of defense is in front basically all dealing with the same problems. So there's I may add to what I just said, I think also the reason why I brought up the idea of the public um, broadcasting um, channels is I think there's a sort of, maybe it's naive to think that if we get, for example, these sorts of analysis of the situation in one specific area and we have similar um, works or, or research into, for example, healthcare or, or education, there are all such important topics that are um, endangered today. And if we bring those out to the audience, because we are all here. I think they're all kind of related to the art world at large. But we haven't talked about the audience yet or the people outside of that system, but if we want them also, I mean, I think we would be urged to be more, to be less apathic if we knew that everybody outside of this world would be also informed or might also learn that this is happening in, um, in this specific sector or the other ones. I mean, just really quick, in the United States there's a TV show called Frontline, which has been on for about 30 years. It's won countless awards from Peabody's to Pulitzer's, and it's constantly somewhat, I mean, it does misfire, I mean, everyone's human, uh, constantly attacks and has been attacking things like neoliberalism for 30 years with very in depth uh, uh, interviews, documentaries, and things like that. And that's on a channel called PBS, or Public Broadcasting Service. And a majority of the attack on the cuts of arts is specifically to take funding out of PBS, which is specifically aimed at preventing the TV show that critiques the politicians from being on TV. Um, another question for you, I'm speaking about how we can organize better. You mentioned that the initiative this ended in the sort of dystopic falling out from an agreement. I mean, you, I, I really I couldn't really go into this subject because we were here for another reason, but now that we're on the topic, could you say a little bit more? Because I imagine it started with the same sort of history. I mean, the manifesto of the people who founded it right. is really fantastic. Yeah. Uh, they also, I mean, it only existed for eight months, but the program they realized is superb. I mean, I only uh, gave some headlines of what they did. I think this is already interesting. Mm -hmm. So I think that on one end, we would say that uh, this group of people uh, has realized it's all the world. Um, but um, although they wanted to be open about the finances, all the financial factors were open. Mm -hmm. So when you would enter the building, you would see what was spent for what? And it was spent a lot of money. Everybody, all this is right. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, And these records also still exist. Um, but it fell apart through um, basically uh, money issues and who was uh, deciding what. And uh, so, Edith um, Wichmann is a, a collector who put the most money in it. Um, in fact, the was the guy who was spending the most. He was still there. And at a certain point, it was too much. 
Um, what is though very interesting is that this same easy fisherman then became involved into a left wing magazine, which is called Two. And I don't know whether anybody, anybody in the room really knows this, but this magazine was, uh, uh, was edited by me, uh, and it, it, it existed for a long time, uh, and it was uh, a magazine devoted attention to all these issues we are now talking about, uh, about uh, failing uh, educational systems, about the, how uh, our workers are being uh, underpaid. So it was really a electric magazine that Fishman was funding. Um, and this ended also tragically. Um, namely, there was a, there was a, fire, a fire set in, in the place where there was the, the, the printing machine. Is by uh, right wing, by right wing protesters, and that this was basically the end of that adventure. But it, it indicates again that um, uh, again this magazine that did it last for uh, about eight years. So every two weeks there was a magazine which was being distributed to the factories as well as in the cultural place. Um, it's 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 not a proof that things can be handled uh, differently. And so if we complain about media. Which I think is, is correct mm -hmm. because people like the videos can't make these films anymore on television, at least in Belgium. Mm -hmm. um, if it's true that uh, major uh, newspapers like the WhatsApp and the NSA are under paying attention to uh, relevant um, uh, activities in, uh, in that respect, that I even have not informed about the great movement that are being uh, mm -hmm. the are happening. Then I think we should invent really new models, mm -hmm. like the Fishmans and the uh, Cornelius have done at the end of the 60s. Mm -hmm. If they fail for six months, I mean, I, I think it's important to see how such a failure can have an impact on, on individual lives. But on the other hand, it has been realized. And it's a learning process. Are there any. Uh, it's just a curiosity. Uh, because I, I it's the first time I've seen the Maybe films. a little bit louder? Yeah. Sorry. It's the first time I've seen the film. I mean, I, I haven't seen the film in their entirety. And uh, my impression was that seeing this exit in this way, it seems as if the governmental power, let's say the church and the police, are relegated into a kind of specificity that is the national one in Italy. Because then in Documenta you don't have the appearance of these powers. So is it a chance? That, is there a reason? Are also like uh, these figures present in the documenta documentaries or not? So the, the, the let's say the documenta films <coughs> really focus on the organizers, the persons who criticize the organizers, the artists, uh, whether they are criticizing or not, and the artworks. These are the actors in the documenta films, and some some uh, people who. Uh, who work as an art critic, like Pierre Cristalli, is it is an art critic. He, he's kind of people that appear in the documentary films. But of course, uh, when you make film about the uh, Venice Biennial, it is very important to, to, uh, to show how this whole thing is being set and seen. I think this is crucial. It's crucial to, to see the cardinal. Because it was the cardinal was also uh, having a say in who got the British prize. <laughs> I think it's really incredibly important. Yeah. I mean, it's also it's the, uh, the authority of the determination of quality in the film. I mean, they mentioned a couple of times in the documentary film that there are no kinds of decisions on competition. As if that makes it better. It's yeah, the list of people who say this. Because uh, two years before, they had been at the Vietnam, where, the, where the, of course, they had this whole ceremony, which I have called the false essence of this event, uh, can't be denied. And it's important to. <coughs> I think it's great the film started with yeah. And I, I don't think by accident the word is the same mark. <laughs> <laughs> if there are no other questions, uh, we're 10 minutes over time. So um, thank you for the speaker.